of how many human beings can it be said that he or she does something better than anyone else in the world? Through a combination of natural gifts and steely determination, Maria Callas made herself one of that select company. Millions of people who had never stepped inside an opera house or been able to whistle more than a few notes of one fine day all knew about the legendary Callas. In many ways, she fitted the popular conception of the diva, a woman of regal personality and fiery temper, whose peculiar excellence in her chosen profession enabled her to consort with the rich and the powerful. Those who came under her spell remained devotees for life. Among them were two Englishmen, with perhaps a wider experience of the ways of opera stars than anyone else in this country. Sir John Tooley, for many years General Administrator of the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, and Lord Harwood, the retired Managing Director of the English National Opera. I heard her in early August 1947 in her debut role in Italy, indeed in Europe, in La Gioconda. She wasn't a world figure. She sang with a very strong cast in the open air at the great Arena di Verona. People like Richard Tucker making his Italian debut, the famous baritone, veteran baritone, Talia Bue, and the bass, Rossi Lemeni and Serafine Canati. It was a very strong cast indeed, and she was absolutely outstanding in it. And she was paid, I'm going to guess, 35 pounds a performance. It was not bad, 50 pounds perhaps performance. The others were probably paid 100. She was a, a beginner but a beginner already of a very high potential, although she told me I happened to meet her then. I was taken around to see her between the fourth and fifth acts of this very long performance of Gioconda, and she said, oh, I hope you're going to stay for the last act. You're not coming to say goodbye because everybody leaves for the last act. It's so long. That's when I have my big scene and my aria. She did impress me enormously. I found her very sympathetic, the voice quite unique, very powerful, very edgy, it was never a conventionally beautiful, round, blonde voice. Not at all. It was dark, strong, acid sometimes. Awkward to subdue, obviously, from her point of view, but already very exciting. Maria had very, very special qualities. She had this capability of perceiving what the composer wanted. And she was able to transform the notes into something that was totally living and totally credible. Another thing that, that Maria did, which really no other singer has done, is to bring to life, and I mean, advisedly say a life, a vast part of the Italian repertory, which had lain dormant for a long time. She had not the world's most beautiful voice. She would at times make ugly sounds. But against that, you have to match this extraordinary artistry which has rarely been achieved by any other singer. Sir John Tooley. The possessor of this phenomenal voice was by birth, if not in any other way, American. In 1923, Maria's father, a Greek pharmacist called George Kalogeropoulos, decided to leave his native land and try his luck in New York. He opened a drugstore in Manhattan, and it was there in December of that year that his third child, Cecilia Sophia Anna Maria, was born. By the time she was christened, her father had shortened the family name to Callas. She became interested in singing when she was quite young and found in music some escape from an otherwise rather dull life during the American Depression. One of Maria's first successes was on a radio amateur talent show compared by the comedian Jack Benny she got second prize. There weren't going to be many occasions in later life when she'd be content with that. In 1937, Maria's mother decided to leave her husband in New York and take Maria and her elder sister, who was also a talented musician, back to Greece. At 14, Maria was admitted to the National Conservatory in Athens, where she studied under the Spanish soprano Elvira de Hidalgo. From her, Maria gained her first insights into the art of bel canto, singing with beauty of tone, perfect phrasing, clear articulation. During the German occupation of Greece, Maria got her chance to perform at the Athens Opera, when the leading soprano, who was to sing Tosca, fell ill, and De Hidalgo recommended her pupil as a replacement. Maria was then 17, fat rather than plump, but if her appearance was unattractive, her voice was remarkable, 
and created a sensation. By the end of the war, Maria Callas was the brightest star in the Athens Opera and already an object of jealous concern to her colleagues. Her contract was not renewed. She rejoined her father in New York and after auditioning at the Metropolitan Opera was offered a contract to sing Leonora in Fidelio and Madame Butterfly. She turned them both down. As she weighed 13 stone, she would have made a rather ponderous butterfly. And she told the general manager that she'd only sing suitable roles and that one day the Met would be begging her to perform. She was 21. The production that was to be the breakthrough for her, where Lord Harwood and others first saw her, was La Gioconda at Verona, under the greatest of Italian operatic conductors, Tullio Serafine, whose protégé she then became. I was doing uh, Valkyria, which was my second year at the Fenice of Venice, and I remember there was a great, shall we say, uh, an influenza epidemic, and they were without a uh, soprano for Puritani of Bellini. And uh, poor old Serafine was exhausted, desperate, he couldn't find this singer and that singer. So his wife heard me singing the aria, sight reading the aria. And she came in, uh, it was in his apartment, uh, Master Seraphine's apartment. She says, uh, she said, will you do me a favor? When my husband comes in, will you please sing that for him? I said, well, it'll please him and make him happier, yes. In fact, I did when he came back. He never said a word. The next day, 10 o'clock in the morning, was after my, already my first performance of Valkyria. I was called on the telephone, please put your robe and come down. Maestro Serafine. I said, Maestro, I'm not washed up. It'll take me about half an hour. He says, no, 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 come down the way you are. Of course, we wouldn't even say no to it. It was sort of a veneration for the Maestro mm. then. And uh, I went down. And he said, sing. I said, what? Sing what you to uh, sang to me yesterday. There was the director of the theater, Catozzo, then. And uh, I said, uh, I knew I was forced to sing the aria. And uh, sight read, of course, which was the second time or third time I sight read it. I heard them talking, and he says uh, to me, well, look, Maria, you're going to do this role in a week. I said, I'm going to do what in a week? He says, you're going to sing Puritania in a week. I undertake that you study it. But I said, I can't. I have three more Valkyrias. I can't do it. It's ridiculous that I sing Puritani. He says, I guarantee you that you can. So I said, well, inside of myself. Is that crazy enough to think that? Then I, I was still young and, you know, being young, you have to uh, gamble. With Seraphine's vast prestige to back her, Callas was soon in worldwide demand. The special qualities that conductors, impresarios and audiences all saw in this exciting new singer did not include a classical purity of tone. Many found her voice at times disturbingly harsh, even unpleasant. The conductor Carlo Maria Giulini. You know, it's not possible, I think, to say the most beautiful voice. There are voices with the sound is perhaps more beautiful. But what is fascinating, that after a few minutes that you heard Maria Callas, you were taken. And the special sound of her voice, very particular, very personal sound, you got used. And in this moment, you were taken by this. And uh, the miracle was there. 
someone who sang with Callas many times, the late Tito Gobby, agreed with those who found a harshness in her voice. But... Why not in a big painting, in a masterpiece? There is something wrong, something ugly, but it's a characteristic. Without this, it will be too, maybe too sweet. And then uh, it doesn't matter. It's important is to be different, to be somebody which catch the attention of the old world. And she was different in this kind of way. She was unique. In the early part of her career, Callas looked the typical prima donna, a woman of Wagnerian dimensions, a Brunhilde, not a butterfly. And then, suddenly, there came an astonishing transformation, as Carlo Maria Giulini recalls. The morning of the second performance, Traviata, I received a, a telephone call and said to me, Tebaldi is ill. What shall you do? I don't know. The only thing is to do, I have another soprano. And he said to me, do you know a soprano named Maria Callas? And I said, yes, I heard her singing Turco in Italia by Rossini in Rome. And he said to me, she's here and she's ready to sing tonight. And so this was our first meeting, the first time that I met this very thick woman, unelegant, but with unbelievable voice and this musicality, of course. And so we performed Traviata, and, uh, well, after the performance she sang Splendid, and Goodbye, and after this I became permanent in Scala. After one and a half year of this time, I never met her anymore, Maria, I was walked out of the artist entry of the Scala, and I saw on the side most elegant lady, very slim, slim, yeah, and very, very, very elegant. And I walked, and I heard, buongiorno maestro. And I turned, and I looked to her, and she said to me, but you don't recognize me. And I said, I'm very sorry, not man, but I am Maria Callas. And she was another woman, absolutely another woman. She lost 64 pounds in just over a year. With her excess weight, she'd also shed the inferiority complex about her appearance, which had dogged her since childhood. The last obstacle had been removed between Callas and the kind of opera she believed in. Of course, opera is preposterous in the first place, because uh, frequently you say on stage, well, andiamo, 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 because uh, people will find us, and yet they're still there. That's what makes a duetto. Of course, what is the main thing that musicians should do is give it the most credibility possible and to persuade the public of its reality. So if we really don't try our very best to give it much seriousness and much persuasiveness and dignity, uh, it's not taken in with pleasure. <laughs> In Verona, Callas met a local manufacturer of building materials by the name of Gian Battista Meneghini. Against the wishes of his family, he and Callas were married. He was 53, 30 years her senior. It was not a happy choice. Although what sort of husband could have satisfied the demands of the Callas personality and withstood the high-pressure life she led? Meneghini gave up his job to become her business manager. 
Impresarios, among them the then director of the Metropolitan Opera in New York, Sir Rudolf Bing, found him an awkward man to deal with. He didn't want to take checks from the Metropolitan, so he wanted cash. So by that time her fee was quite substantial. I arranged that it should be paid to him in five dollar bills, so he could hardly get through the door. <laughs> I was so annoyed. She was also difficult, but in a totally different way. She was an artist to her fingertips, and really in a strange way, whenever she entered the house, I don't mean the stage, the house, to a rehearsal, there was a hush. Everybody just sort of respected her to such an extent that they were almost frightened. She was very nice, she was a very pleasant colleague, she was not intimate with anybody, she was friendly and... Uh, I got on very well with her, and incidentally, she happened to be the one and only artist in all my 22 years at the Metropolitan who ever called me by my first name. I didn't mind it, I was rather, rather proud about it. She was a woman and an artist who needed a lot of encouragement, a lot of reassurance. She had this reputation, you know, only too well, of being very difficult. In my own personal experience with her, she was only difficult when somebody or something got in her way of achieving what she thought was right. Like Sir John Tooley, Maestro Giulini didn't find Callas difficult to work with. Never. Never. She was 100%, 1000% professional. She was an example for everybody, for the colleagues, for the carists, for everybody, and never it happened that she was one minute late, she was perhaps half an hour early. The only point for her was to work, to understand the problems, but never, never difficulties. The two directors, best able to realise Callis's desire to make the operas in which she sang convincing, were the filmmakers, the late Lucchino Visconti and Franco Zeffirelli. Zeffirelli, who produced her in more than one outstanding success, managed to cope with this tigerish personality. I have several experiences actually with the kind of women, temperamental women, the tigresses, with like Elizabeth Taylor, like Anna Magnani, Faye Danova now, I mean, they are all considered possible women to deal with. They are marvelous women to deal with, but you have to be very, very loyal to them. Don't be devious. If you're a double dealing villain, you're in trouble. And she was a fantastic trooper help with the chorus, with the other singers, for lights, for endless costume fittings. She was really was, was great, great trooper. Professionalism is fine as far as it goes. Most successful performers have it, but clearly there was something more to Callas. Zeffirelli. Actually, it is something I never yet I have not understood. This woman was a rather mediocre woman personally, I mean, culturally. She never been to an art exhibition except to be photographed. I think she read very few books in her life. She couldn't see the difference between Manet and Monet. I mean, she really was not a cultivated woman. But when she arrived somewhere, no matter where, on a bus, anywhere, you couldn't take your eyes off this woman. She had a gift, which was a combination of knowing, feeling, and being able to deliver, I mean, to, to be up to this kind of image. She always been extremely ambitious to become somebody. I mean, that was a vow when she was young and hungry and desperate and fat and ugly. She swore one day I'll become really the queen of the world, and she managed. I mean, she was not faking anything. She was simply adding a plus dimension to already a top dimension. You see what I mean? Anyway, I never understood quite how she managed. It, it, I was totally mesmerized by, by Maria, no matter... It, Sometimes she's been very unpleasant. She went down sometimes to the level of the kitchen gossips, you know, and a lot of times. But that was part of her total character. She had no majestic dignity uh, as a constant rule of her, of her life, her manners at all. Callis's unpredictability was clearly something that those who worked with her, like Tito Gobby, who sang Scarpia to her Tosca, had to allow for. We very every day, every night, and... Uh, the last period in the last performances of Tosca we did in Covent Garden, Paris, and in Metropolitan, she was a little preoccupied, and so she called me every morning. We had a long talk at the telephone, time one hour and even more. Tito, I'm sorry, tonight I'm going to change everything, 
be ready to follow me. I will not do what we are used to do. I will change. Say, okay, Maria, do what you want. And she did little changes here and there. But that's happened because we, we never perform in a kind of format. So we were free. She was Tosca and I was Scarpia. Doesn't matter if the chair is in my right or in my left. I will find the chair, I will not sit on the floor. We were just watching each other, controlling each other, uh, with a kind of ex excitement, which is a marvelous feeling for two singers. Yes, singers, but actors. Actors, because we, we knew our role, and for me, I believe I am ready to think that if you took out everything else, and you left Maria and Tito Gobbi on stage, you will have a second act of Tosca. Without orchestra, without the call, without anything, you can have it.